we can get started here and recap uh, where we were last class. Last class we, we looked back at our derivation and then we ended up here in the section where we said, let's consider this filter and it's operating at constant pressure. We spoke a bit of the last time how that's pretty straightforward to achieve in practice uh, with simple feedback control. And in fact, a centrifugal pump can deliver a constant pressure for you depending where you are on the pump curve. So it's, it's no problem to operate at constant pressure. This isn't an artificial assumption. It's quite practical. Then let's uh, show this equation here. We've got one over the area times d by dt. And as shown in the first line over there, we ended up with this equation that says the total pressure drop over the unit. That's our driving force. And we have two resistances. We've got the medium's resistance Rm, and we have resistance due to the cake. So driving force over resistance is equal to flow per unit area. So it's the standard equation we have in all of engineering. Let's just quickly take a, a, a moment to consider one important point about this equation that uh, a few people have some questions that shows that there's a bit of misunderstanding here. Delta P total, this term here in the numerator, this is a positive quantity. It's a pressure drop over the, over the cake and the medium combined. It's a positive value. Viscosity is a positive quantity. Cake resistance and medium resistance, both of these are positive quantities. So this term on the right hand side can only be positive. The area here is a positive quantity. That means dv by dt must always be positive. What does that mean in English? dv by dt must be positive. What about the increase in over time? Sorry? What about the increase in over time? Which volume? Um, the volume passing through the filter, medium, and the case must be increasing with time. So if we plot in T versus B, well, let's be more, more specific. If we plot dV by dt, that's a positive quantity. It can never be negative. Okay? So we cannot go on the negative part of the axis. The rate of change of the volume with time, that's how fast the liquid is coming up per unit time, is positive. You would expect that at the start of the filtration, you get high rates of fluid flowing through the cake, and that will drop off and taper out to zero. If you plot it V versus time, we said last class, what shape does that have? So the quadratic tapering off, and we'll go up and up, and we'll eventually over long periods of time taper and come become flat line, but it can never go back down again. V of T can never go up so do that, right? So that's not possible because that indicates our slope is negative. And we know that dV by dt can never be negative. Okay? So dV by dt is always positive. V of t is also positive. It's the total volume of filtrate. So let's be clear here. That's the total volume of filtrate. Okay, it will always go up. But once we've captured the filtrate on the other side of the medium, it, it stays there. So the total <coughs> or the cumulative volume of the filtrate uh, will always be a positive quantity. And so look at your equations and interpret them in that context as well. Now, let's take a look at that back here at this equation. And we can understand why this is true. Why this dp by dt gets smaller and smaller and tends to zero? It's because which terms are changing with time? Is my area changing? No, viscosity is not changing. Rm? Rc is changing. Okay, so pressure drop is constant. That's our assumption here, and it's a fair one. Viscosity is constant, Rm is constant. So only Rc is changing. Which way is it changing? Up. Increasing up, so my denominator is getting larger and larger. The V by dt must be getting smaller and smaller as time progresses. Okay, so all of this makes sense and, and hangs in a consistent manner with our experience with these units. Okay. 
So important to, to have that in mind. Then we said at the end of the class yes, uh, last time, let's take this equation, flip it around, break it into two portions now. We have two terms, a term due to the median's resistance and then a term due to the cake's resistance. So this term in here, area's constant, pressure drops constant, viscosity is constant, RN is constant, that constant V is a description of the resistance due to the medium below. This term over here, what's constant in there? This term in blue, is everything constant in there? Yep, everything is constant in there, including alpha. Okay, the only thing that's changing is V. So Kp times V, that term together, those product is, the Kp part is constant, V is changing the term. Alpha is the specific cake resistance. So last time, let's go back here. This is an important point, and we're going to take this up today. Alpha is a specific cake resistance, which is a functioning of the specific surface area, which is constant, and epsilon. Epsilon stays constant if pressure drop is constant. If you change your pressure drop, you're applying more force over that cake. You're going to compact the solids more closely epsilon will then move. But provided pressure drop is constant, epsilon is constant. Okay, so everything in this term in blue remains constant with time. So that's why we can integrate this term here on the left, the dt, because nothing else changes with time. So there's nothing, we don't have to bring everything, anything over to the left-hand side. That integral can be integrated and we get time, and on the right-hand side, we integrate the things that change with volume of filtrate. Well, the only thing that, should, that we, after integrating that, is we end up with that form. <coughs> this is our starting point for, to, for the example we considered last time. Okay, so, last time then we said, let's consider this uh, filtration occurring, where we measure volume of filtrate with time, and we, we plot it, the volume of filtrate on the x-axis and time divided by volume on the y-axis, we can then estimate from the slope and the intercept, we can get the respective values of Rn and Rc. And so that's what we, we ended up with the class last time. We calculated Rm with alpha as well, and from alpha, uh, we use alpha then to go ahead and calculate Rc, the k resistance. k resistance, recall we said, changes with time. And we, we, we know that, we expect that, we said that earlier, that will increase as time progresses. So we have to calculate it at a particular given time. And I've used 200 meters. Make sure you can uh, repeat those calculations on there. And again, it's on the spreadsheets on the website. Now let's come back to alpha. So that was a recap of last class. Let's take a look now at back here at alpha and how it's going to vary. This set of experiments we did over here was an experiment at a constant controlled pressure drop of 38 kPa. If I repeated that experiment at a different pressure drop, I will get a different slope and I will get a different alpha. And if I increase the pressure to some other third value, I'll get a new third value of alpha and so on. What I can eventually do is I can build up a series of experiments and plot alpha against delta p. So alpha is that term that, that describes the cake's compressibility for us, and we expect the cake's compressibility to change with pressure. So if I increase pressure across that cake, alpha, the cake resistance, or specific cake resistance, is going to go up or down? What's your expectation? Before you answer that, take a look back at the equation for alpha. What is your expected uh, expectation of what this plot is going to look like? If I increase the pressure drop, what should happen to this resistance alpha? What might you expect? Go up. Look at what terms make up alpha. Um, 
Okay. Um, so k1 is a constant. Density of the particles is a constant. Epsilon is going to change. Which way is epsilon going to change if you increase the pressure? Is there a relationship between alpha and alpha? Yeah. How is epsilon going to change if you increase pressure? baseline value multiplied by the pressure drop raised to the power f. Okay. For rigid solids that do not change and compress, if you increase the pressure, you won't increase your alpha. Okay. So for that case where f is zero, so this is rigid solids, very firm particles, we call that an incompressible cake. But there's many cakes for the vast majority of them, especially biomaterials, so cellular products, if you apply a pressure to them, they compress closer and closer to each other. Fibers are another example. Where those cakes are very compressible, you can get voyages that are as low as 0.1. Okay, so indicating that you've only got 10% open space. That's an incredibly low volume. <coughs> For very soft particles that are pliable, you can push them and pack them much, much closer to each other. So in those instances, the cake is extremely compressible. Incompressible cakes are rigid solids like a particular material uh, ore and mining rock. And so those are generally uh, called incompressible cakes. And those exponents, F, will be much, much smaller. Cakes that are more compressible uh, will have higher exponents, F. F typically will not exceed 1. So at the extreme, it will be, if that's an extremely compressible cake, it will be 1. Most cakes are around about 0.3, 0.5 indicating that there will be an increase in, in alpha. And in general, you'll notice the trend along that sort of line for that shape. And if you plot it on log axis, axes, log of alpha versus log of the pressure drop, you'll get a slope f. Okay, so what we do to calculate that constant f and this alpha zero, neither of which we know, we go ahead and do several experiments of the example shown just prior to it. So we go here to the lab, repeat this experiment, and from each experiment you'll get a delta p value and you'll get an alpha value. And you repeat the experiment at a higher delta p and it's called a different alpha. So here we've gone and recorded and calculated alpha, repeat the experiment at a higher pressure drop, get a new alpha, and we can go and construct this sort of curve and estimate f that constant f as well as alpha zero. Okay, so that will be the slope and the intercept respectively of the log axis. Okay, so you'll do this in the next assignment, which I'll post in the next day or two. You're plotting for f or for alpha not. You're plotting alpha versus delta p. Once you plot this on log axes, so log delta p and log alpha you'll get a straight line with intercept of alpha naught and log alpha naught and slope of it. So that's how we obtain it. Now you can go to textbooks, Perry's for example, and you can look up values of alpha naught and f, but you'll almost find that the particular solids you're dealing with are not going to be in that table. So you have to resort to this experimental approach pretty much in every single case. So f is your 
Exactly. F is a, a compressive value. Alpha now is just a value. Exactly. It's just the baseline value added at a given. Okay, so cakes that are, are not compressible will have Fs that are small and tending to zero. Epsilon is a function of pressure, no, but what we can do is estimate alpha as a function of pressure, and alpha then is, uh, recall alpha is, if you go back a slide or two, is a function of epsilon and S0. Okay, so if you make the assumption that S0 is constant, then you can get that, but it's, it's a new variant. And Epsilon is a voidage, so it's a number between 0 and 1. one I mean, a 1 indicates 100% void, no solid, and 0 is no solid. Okay. So that's uh, constant pressure filtration. Let's just briefly consider constant rate filtration, which occurs in a few limited instances, so we won't focus too much on it. But Constant rate filtration simply says that you apply a variable pressure now, you change your pressure over time in order that you get a, variable, uh, a constant flow rate, the d by dt. So there's no change in your rate of flow. You get a continual flow, the d by dt is constant, or, uh, sorry, it's zero. There's no, I shouldn't say zero, it's just a constant. It doesn't change with time. Is zero. No, it doesn't vary with time. That's right. So the e by dt is zero. And if you in, if you uh, put that in and integrate, you will get v divided by t, which we know as q in other words. So the rate of the volumetric flow, and that's equal to this changing pressure drop divided by these two resistances, the cake resistance and the heat resistance. Standard uh, approach is to solve now for delta p. And let's pull out this V over T term and call it Q. So we get a Q term here and we get a Q squared term. So you can, you can see this situation where you would plot this, this flow rate against this varying delta P. Okay. But like I said, for the most part, we're not going to focus on that too much because what we find is for most filtration systems, plate frame and the rotary drum, that this region of constant rate only occurs for the first few seconds of the filtration and after that you become, uh, move into the mode of constant pressure. So it's only for a very short time that you, you actually experience constant rate. And I'll prove this to you in the next example, we'll, like, we'll see that um, and actually determine how, for what time duration we are in constant rate. So it's very, very short. Okay, so let's do that in fact. Uh, up here next. So back to constant pressure filtration. So that was just a little interview with a constant, constant rate. Let's go back to constant pressure filtration. So our base equation is this one over here. T is equal to this constant V, which is a function of the medium, plus this constant KP, a function of the cake, times the volume squared divided by, t, uh, by 2. So that's our equation here. B is defined and KP is defined as well. What I'd like you to do is for the next few minutes, consider this example. This is a continuation of the previous one. Okay, so the data we acquired from the previous example gets carried over here. We're now, we've done that lab experiment that we, we looked at there earlier. And let's say we've determined that alpha is some alpha naught, there's alpha naught multiplied by the pressure drop raised to the power of 0.3. So F is 0.3 in this instance. So that tells me how alpha changes at, at different pressures. Delta P is in Pascals and alpha is in the regular SI units. What we're going to do now is we're going to take that lab data and we want to predict how a plate and frame press will operate. We wish to purchase, for example, the plate and frame press. We're going to operate it at that given pressure drop. I'm going to feed solids to that prelatent frame pressure uh, unit with that given concentration. So 300 kilograms of solids per meter cubed of filtrate. That's my solids concentration. And what I'd like to do is run that plate frame press. So, so this guy over here, as we showed last time, I'm going to operate it for 45 minutes. 
let that cake build up for 45 minutes, and then discharge the cake, clean it out. So that's going to take 15 minutes, so a total of one hour, and then repeat. So 45 minutes of actual operation, 15 minutes of cleaning. And we know that in that 45 minutes, it's, it's straightforward from a mass balance. We can determine that if I'm feeding my solids at a given solids concentration, that I'm going to get in that 45 minute period eight and a half meters cubed of filtrate. So 45 minutes, I'll get 8.5 meters cubed of filtrate. So just to recap what, what's happening here, we've got time, here we've got volume. I'm going to operate for 45 minutes. And at that point, I've obtained 8.5 meters cubed of filtrate. Okay, clean out the filter press, restart this again, and I'll, I'll get this curve that is described by T is EV. So that's the name, that's where that curve comes from for our previous integration. There's only one thing though, when we, when we wish to purchase a plate and frame press, we need to determine how many of these plates and frames to buy. That's going to determine the length of this unit. So each frame and plate, let's say for example, is one meter squared. That's roughly the size of this unit here in the diagram. How many of those plates do we need to purchase? In other words, what is the total area we need? That's our question we're trying to answer. So, Let's go back to our strategy. Find what we know and what we don't know. Explore the problem. What equations apply? What, um, what is the situation we're dealing with here? And then plan your strategy. So take the next three, four minutes and work through those three steps. Write down what you know, what you don't know, but focus mostly on your plan. No need to get out calculators and calculate what that area is. But just plan your strategy so that you can solve for A equals and get the answer. But don't, don't actually compute. When you operate at constant pressure, you get a curve of Okay, so we have that. We have 
filter because of the resistance of the filter? It's just the resistance of the filter, right? So when you do the lab experiment, we emphasized last time that that lab experiment must be done using the same media that you're going to use in practice on the plate frame press. So RM can be reused. What Does about RM change? Though? Does RM change? Oh, it's immediate. Immediate. Right, right, right. Okay, KP. KP is equal to U times CS alpha divided by area squared is delta P. Okay. Same, same problem here. There's the area which I don't know. Delta P, which I do know for the new situation. Viscosity, which I know, CS is a slurry concentration. It's a different slurry concentration, in fact, to when I did the lab experiment. Right? So in the lab experiment, I used 24 kilograms of solids per meter cubed. Now I'm using 300. Okay, so it's, it's significantly different from the lab case. But that's OK. Alpha, again, as, as before. Okay, so we've we, there's some things we know, some things we don't know. Our biggest problem is obviously the area, which is our goal in this problem is to calculate that. Yeah. Two equations. Two equations, two unknowns. What are the two equations? This one. Oh, this one. Three equations. The B and the K. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. But can we use the arm equation and solve the K, P, and B? The whole equation that just solve three or <coughs> Okay. So that's, uh, that's, that's the suggestion here, is can we just use this equation, solve what we know, and solve for error? Does that sound plausible? Yeah, okay, absolutely. Can you take a shortcut? Right, so B is a function of area, KP is a function of area. This is a mess. Well, not, it's not that hard. <laughs> okay. But you can say that. Why? Okay, so let's let's not believe that you can say that. Let's actually assume that, that B cannot be cancelled out. B B cannot be cancelled out. And you can go do all the messy work and get a formula 2700 A squared minus 1077a minus 17.6 times 10 to the minus 10 to the 6 and solve that set that equal to zero. So sub in the numbers, that's that's for you to do at home. We don't need to work through that yet. Oh, that equation was written from the equation for voice. From that first equation. Okay, so so sub in the numbers, a is your only unknown, you get this this equation. 2700A squared minus 1077A minus 17.6 times 10 to the 6. Okay, so it's a standard quadratic. And you can solve that and you get A is equal to 80.9 meters squared. Okay, so prove that to yourself at home. It's, we don't need to work through that here. Okay. Yes. You, you get that equation without assuming B equals 0. Yeah, because it's a quadratic. Okay, so A squared comes through here and the A term the other A So I so said let's preliminary assume that we cannot do this. I'm telling you you can and we'll, we'll now prove it. So let's take take a look back at this equation though. Before we did that cancellation, what does this equation mean in English? Just describe it to someone. What is that equation telling you? The T equals. But if we want to take shortcuts, we need to understand what we're shortcutting. So what is that equation telling telling someone? So has no idea, someone else has an idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, the time you, you said that the, the time it takes to reach the volume. Okay, the time taken to reach that 8.5 meters cubed. Okay, that's correct. What's on the right hand side? So this is the contribution 
to the time due to the medium. This is the contribution to the time due to the resistance of the cake. So two portions, it's split out in two parts. So if you go calculate that area, and using the quadratic formula, you get that area. If you take the shortcut, assuming that the cake resistance is the only significant component, and you can ignore the medium, that means we can write T is equal to KP B squared over 2, and you solve a much simpler problem, and you can show, in fact, analytically that area is mu CS times alpha times B squared divided by 2. Okay, so if you do it, do it symbolically, you can substitute in and solve, and then you get A is equal to Absolutely true, but let's go back to this previous example where we had this medium resistance and the cake resistance were comparable. Rm and Rc were comparable values. But notice what slurry concentration we were using. 24 meters kilograms of solid per meter cubed. Okay. Very, very low slurry concentration. Now we, we more than triple, uh, more than take that up by an order of magnitude. Now your cake is going to be the only resistance that really matters, okay? Let's say, though, that you go through and take the shortcut, okay? So you go and take the shortcut, but you're still not confident that what you did was right. But because we, don't, we didn't do this work, we don't actually know that this number is 8.9, so we don't know that. Let's say we did the shortcut and you got that answer. How can you prove now to yourself that what you did was right. So remember you said we make an assumption and we always need to go back and check our assumption. How can you do it? Calculate for B, K, P, and so for A. I mean, so for A. You've got A. You've got A. Now you want to check that this was a reasonable assumption that you made. Okay, so go check B, B is equal to something and go check K, P, B squared over 2, and that's equal to something, and the two of them must add up to the total time. The sum of these must add up to 2,700 seconds, which is equal to 45 minutes. Okay. But shouldn't also the second value should be much higher than the first one? Should be. So if your assumption was correct, that will be true. Okay. So using this area here of 80.8, and you calculate BV, you get an answer of 113 seconds. Okay? This answer here is 2,700, roughly. It's not exact. I, I haven't calculated, so I, I, if someone wants to calculate what it is, go ahead. But basically, the key is that this is 113 seconds, less than two minutes out of the 45 minutes is going to be you're in a zone where the medium is presenting roughly equal resistance to the cake. After that, the, the medium doesn't matter and it's only the cake. If we're going to check our BV anyways, why don't we just do the first one? Because it's harder to solve a quadratic. Oh. I mean, it's just you have to rearrange it. There's, I've gone from here to here, but it's about three, four lines of stuff. Okay. So, we would we'll, we'll like to take short. Okay, but if we take shortcuts, let's prove to ourselves that they can be useful in the sense. Okay. So here, the contribution due to the medium resistance is very much smaller than the contribution due to the K resistance. Okay, so you can go prove to yourself uh, those numbers. Let's take a look now at the second part of the question. It's asking here that if we choose to operate this unit with double the slurry concentration. Okay, so think of this, this is exactly what companies like to do. You've now spent 
hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe millions, on that plate and frame press. It's not a cheap piece of equipment. You now want to increase the throughput to it, i.e. you want to process more solids in your company. So the first thing you do is, well, let's increase the rate of flow of solids to this filter press. The volume of the liquid coming through stays the same. You just want to increase the solid flow. So the slurry concentration doubles. You still want to operate in a 45 minute period. It's the area is fixed. The area is now fixed at 80.8 because you bought this unit with those 80 frames that are, that are in there. What pressure drop do you need to use so that you can still operate within a 45 minute cycle time? Higher or lower? Higher. That's clear. Okay, so we must get an answer that greater pressure is required because our, we're packing more. Uh, greater solids, same area. What is that pressure drop required? What's the plan to, to tackle the problem? Work on that for the next minute or two. Two
So I've just substituted in what KP's definition is, and I've substituted in the definition for alpha. So both of those are in there. We've got delta P in the numerator and denominator. A bit of a mess, but uh, you can prove to yourself using logs that it's 0.7 log <coughs> minus delta P is equal to 8.47. And if you take it and solve that, you get minus delta P required. It's 180 K. So higher pressure as expected with a bit of a mess in between. So just simplify this with the logs. The point 0.3 is F, and that's why you get the point 0.7. It's interesting if you plot this um, the curve, I'll just show you over here. You can repeat that calculation for several values of slurry concentration. So let's just back up here. Here's our baseline. It's 300. This is where we started. And we had a pressure drop of 67,000 required. Okay. If I double the slurry concentration to 600, so I've gone from 300 to 600, I've doubled the slurry concentration, what's happened to my utility costs at delta P? More than doubled. Okay, so even though I double the slurry concentration, my utility costs are more than doubled. So you never get something for nothing. It's going to cost you more and more. In fact, as you go to higher and higher concentrations, that ramps up um, to, to extremely high levels. That is going to be impossible to achieve. Okay. So again, nothing, nothing's for free here. Final uh, question then asks to plot the volume of filtrate leaving the press as a function of time. So that's a straightforward one. The easy stuff is for the end. Simply plot T equals DB plus KP P squared over 2. And you may choose to use that uh, DB term or not. It's not going to make too much of a difference. Question to think about and prove to yourself. This curve of plotting time versus volume of filtrate, okay, we know it's going to look like that. Is the curve going to look the same or different, higher or lower, when CS is double. So this is the big curve for CS equal to 300. This is the volume of filtrate I expect for a given time. So we, we, we keep going to 45 minutes, we stop, we clean out, and at 45 minutes I get 8.5 meters cubed. What is the curve going to look like when CS is double? Yeah, you need to increase the pressure so that you still get to 8.5 at the end. So we know our endpoint is going to be the same because when we double the slurry concentration, CS, we, we operate at higher pressure to prove that. What is that curve going to look like? We, we're going to start and end at the same point. At time zero, we've got zero filtrate. At time end, we've got 8.5 meters cubed. But what's the path going to be in the middle? Go about it. Higher. Okay, you'll prove it to yourself and try not to switch. Okay, so tomorrow we uh, we start a new section. We finish mechanical section. We start membrane.